Perfect. So uh, my name is Monica Mullins and I'm a Climate Action Officer working with the Climate Ambassador Programme and the Primary Climate Ambassador Programme with Untashka's Environmental Education Unit. And I'm delighted to uh, uh, be here with you today to celebrate uh, Climate Action Week. And this is a very special event where we explore climate action and climate change through storytelling with Oshie McGann. So this is our timetable for Climate Action Week. So uh, Ireland's seventh Climate Action Week is running this year from the 16th to the 22nd of October. And we want you to be a part of it. Climate Action Week uh, is all about starting climate conversation with people who might not want know what to do about climate change, but might want to uh, take part in some actions and communications either locally or nationally. Uh, whether you want to explore some climate data or organize a creative virtual event, something like this or encourage others to take climate action, uh, or just simply get outdoors, plant some wildflowers, maybe maintain some hedgerows, or even plant a couple of trees. And here's just a snippet of our timetable from this year, but we have uh, loads of activities, uh, both online and in person uh, throughout Ireland this year. I'm gonna paste the um, full schedule in, in the chat. So. And then this, our Climate Ambassador applications are now open if you know anyone who is interested. So uh, why not be part of a prestigious group and become one of Ireland's Climate Ambassadors? It's an opportunity to take mean, meaningful action and carry out climate, climate communications in your local area, be it your school or workplace as well. And it's open to all teachers, staff and secondary school students. And do drop me an email if you have any questions. I'm going to post my email in the chat after this. So here's just some of our results from 2022. So after training, we asked climate ambassadors if they can carry out maybe two climate actions and two climate communications. But as you can see, some of our climate ambassadors have really went above and beyond. And this is just a summary from Climate Action Week uh, 2023. And we couldn't carry out any of these without our climate ambassadors. And if you do have any ideas or you want to engage with us, our email is climateactionweek or caw at eu.ontashka.org. And I'll post it in the chat as well. And I'm going to share links to applications and just get in touch with me if you have any questions. So now I'm going to stop sharing and hand over to Oshin. And I'm just going to take a moment to introduce Oshin. So, Oshin, thank Sorry, you. Sorry, I thought this might happen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Oshin is a best-selling and award-winning writer and illustrator. He's produced dozens of books and short stories for all ages, uh, including 12 novels in genres uh, ranging from comedy horror to conspiracy thriller, from science fiction, fantasy, and historical fiction. These include Mad Grandad series, Head Barnes, Wrecking Your Head, Wild Stern Saga, and in 2014 and 2015, he was the writer in residence for the Weather Stations. And this was an EU funded project where writers from five different countries were tasked with finding ways uh, to use storytelling and raising awareness of climate change. He has carried on this work through school residencies in primary and secondary schools, and he has carried he's uh, carried out this work uh, as funded by Poetry Ireland in schools, and he's a winner of the Irish AIDS Worldwide Global Schools. So, I'm going to pass over to Oshin if he's ready, and thank you so much again for joining us. Uh, thanks very much for that. Sorry, I I made a mistake and sent a friend of mine, Jane, who's from Poetry Ireland, a panelist link. Um, if you're wondering why she just popped up, hi Jane, how are you? Um, so might need you to mute or or switch off. That was my mistake. Um, hi everybody. Uh, yeah. So my name is Ocean McGann. As Monica explained, I'm a writer and illustrator. Um, and I'm going to be talking about well, basically, um, introducing this. Um, uh, here is called Feel the Change. Monica, can you give me the single? Um, can you put me up as the as the single? window there we go um yeah so sorry i'm gonna be talking about this i'm, I'm gonna be talking about storytelling um uh first i want to say thanks very much to green schools and to poetry ireland who are the the sponsors of this um and uh 
it's some of this might sound a bit weird when I'm talking about Climate Action Week, but I am, as I said, it is primarily about storytelling. Um, this is a creative writing resource. Um, and I will get to that in a minute, but thanks to Monica and Ronya for their part of it and Jane as well. <clears throat> so when I started writing stories, I was very young um, and I, I had to start off writing the same way everybody else has started off writing. And, and uh, the, of the group who had joined in, I'm sure you're probably old, maybe too old to remember how hard it was at the start. You know, when you start off writing, um, we all start off the same way. You don't write words at the start. You draw letters one at a time. And it can be a painstaking business, you know, where you're, you're literally digging the pencil into the page. You're trying to get the shape of the letter right. And it's like you're carving it out of stone. Um, and I started off the same way. But I did start writing fairly early. I started writing stories when I was about six or seven. Uh, obviously, they weren't very good. I didn't know anything about writing. Um, they also tend to be quite violent because I was a typical boy and I wrote stories about uh, monsters and aliens attacking people and fights and explosions and that kind of stuff. Um, I didn't really do subtle stories. I didn't do stories about relationships and friendship and sad things. Um, I liked big stuff blowing up. Um, <clears throat> and my stories at the, at the beginning would have been very short because it took me a long time to write anything. So a typical story I'd have written when I started off would go something like this. Uh, once upon a time, I went to school and there was an elephant in the yard and a dinosaur came along and ate the elephant and I fought the dinosaur and I won. So pretty basic. I hadn't really, you know, I didn't have much character development. I hadn't built up much suspense. I hadn't really worked out my plot. Um, but that's how I started off. Um, and the main thing, the most important thing was that I started off and I was having a good time. And nobody said to me, oh, Sheen, that's stupid. You need to stop. You're never going to be any good at this. So I kept going. Um, and I, because all the books I read at that age had pictures, then I thought if, I thought stories had to come with pictures. So I would sit there drawing pictures with my stories. And I was the kind of kid who made sound effects while he drew. So you can imagine um, I was... Uh, you know, sitting there drawing spaceships or um, fights and making sound, you know, making, <laughs> making animal noises, all that kind of stuff while I'm sitting there writing my stories. Um, and I was also into disasters. I liked, I liked writing stories about disasters and the bigger, the better. You know, I like stories about volcanoes and uh, stuff about tidal waves and asteroids hitting the planet. Um, you know, the bigger, the better. I liked a good body count. Um, so that's how I started off. <clears throat> Excuse me. And as I got older, um, so some of you, I think we're mostly the top end of primary or maybe some secondary, but um, it was around your age or a bit older that we started hearing about, um, as we called it then, global warming. Um, and I, uh, I wasn't impressed, you know. And like I said, I was into disasters. This is because it should have been right up my street. But we started hearing things like, you know, uh, you know, there's going to be warming in the upper atmosphere. And I'd never really spent much time in the upper atmosphere. You know, I'd been up there in a plane. It hadn't really made much of an impression on me. Um, they were saying things like, oh, the glaciers could collapse. And I'm kind of going, I've never been to a glacier. I don't know any glaciers. None of my friends are glaciers. So again, it wasn't having much effect on me. Um, <clears throat> so, and these things... Um, these things are important. It's important that we have something to relate to. So um, as I said, uh, you know, around your age, I was listening to this, but I was also getting into horror at the time. And horror is a really important genre. Horror is like, um, you know, it's almost like we look for things to scare ourselves when you get to a certain age. And I think part of it is to do with, we, we want to kind of, we know we have to deal with stuff in the real world. And it's like our brains need the practice. It's like we need to scare need to find ways that can scare ourselves, but ways that we can kind of back away from when we want to. So if you imagine, um, you know, you're reading a book or watching a film, you can close the book, you can turn the film off. Um, and it's kind of, a, it's almost like your brain is practicing for kind of the harder stuff we may have faced in, late, in, world, in life later on. <clears throat> um, and there are lots of different types of horror. And a lot of the horror would be what we call escapist horror. So we kind of, it's so big and so over the top that you don't really kind of, you know, it's not particularly unpleasant um, because you know it's not real. Um, so you could have some monster biting somebody's head off and there's blood everywhere. Um, and you, it's not something you're going to, it's not really going to get under your skin. It's not something people can relate to because you're not going to say, oh, I hate when that happens. You know, that's happened to me. It happened to me yesterday. You know, it's, oh, it's just so inconvenient. So, um, 
And this is an important part of storytelling. We're looking for things. You want to have an effect on the reader or on the, on the audience. So we look for things that people can actually relate to. So over the top stuff, that can be entertaining, but it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't really get under your skin. Um, and whereas sometimes smaller stuff actually has, has a bigger effect. Um, so this is a true story. He was a friend of mine years ago. And he was um, he was working, he was a mechanic, and he was working on his own car in his front garden. You know, you can't think of a safer place to be. Um, so he was working on the door of the car, and the wind caught the door of the car, and it slammed it shut on his finger, and it took the top of his finger off, right? And there was just a little bit of bone sticking out of the top. Um, now, uh, when I say this in front of a live audience, I can't see anybody's reaction, so it's kind of weird looking out of there. <clears throat> but that always gets a bit more of a reaction than somebody getting their head chopped off, which is completely out, you know, out of proportion. He only lost a fingertip. Um, but he, anyway, he wrapped it in plastic, he put it in ice, and he went to the, the hospital and he said, can I, can you save the fingertip? You know, I'm a mechanic, I need my hands. And they gave him an injection for the pain and he felt much better. Um, and then they said, I, we need you to look at the eye chart. The doctor said, just look at the eye chart there. And he was going, what do you mean look at the eye chart? My finger's the problem. What? Look at, are you a doctor? Look at my finger. There's something wrong with your eyes. And the doctor says, just look at the eye chart for a minute. So he looks over the eye chart and the doctor takes the pliers and he clips the piece of bone off the top of the finger because they had to sew a flap over the top. They couldn't save the fingertip. Now, that's a much smaller injury than getting your head chopped off by a monster. Um, but it has a bigger effect because we've all hurt our fingertips some way or other. You know, it's almost like we get to a certain age and we have to either catch our fingers in a door or hit our thumb with a hammer or do something else to our fingertips. We all know what it's like to hurt our fingertips. It's a very relatable injury um, or stubbing your toe. You know, one of those things, not only does it really hurt, but you also feel really stupid when you do it. Um, and it's something where you, if you see, see it happen to somebody else, it makes you go oh, like that. Um, and that's a really important aspect of storytelling is that you try and find stuff that people can relate to. <clears throat> so as I said, when I first started hearing about global warming, there was there was nothing to relate to. There were no chopped fingers. There were no stub toes. There was nothing where I kind of go, yes, that's, I can relate that to my normal life. Um, now, uh, sorry, hang on a second. I'm missing something. I knew there'd be something. <laughs> um, so when we talk about the environment, that is often one of the biggest problems is that we tend to separate ourselves from there. There's humans and then there's nature. We're something separate. Um, and that is always the case. When you talk environment, when you say the word environment, it tends to be something like I can look out the window here and there's grass and there's trees and that's the environment. That's what we think of. Um, and because it's separate from us, we always feel like, it doesn't really have a big effect on us. We all, you know, we're, we're all right. We have our kind of artificial world in here. Um, but that's not really the case. Um, again, I can't see any of you, um, but you're all sitting there. And I assume you're breathing, you know, um, it is what we're supposed to be doing. And even though you can't see it, the air, of course, is all around you. You are immersed in air the same way that um, we are fish are immersed in water. And though you may not feel it, you're actually under tons of air. Um, there are hundreds of kilometers of air above us. And even though you don't think of it as air does have weight. OK, so you're actually under tons of air, but because you don't feel it, because this is where you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be under tons of air so that it is thick enough to breathe. So you're sitting there and you're breathing air. And I love air. I love air more than I love my mother. I can go more than two minutes without my mother, but you can't breathe family. Um, so we're sitting here. We're all breathing air, breathing air. We're all breathing air, but, um, and like I said, this is where we're supposed to be. Um, <clears throat> not only are we supposed to be able to breathe it, but it, what's really crucial as well is that it is the right temperature. Um, so this is, uh, this is the thermometer. This is what I had to go look for. Um, this is the thermometer. I'm sure you've all seen one before. Um, I'm sure most of you have, have, had your, have had your temperature taken at some point. Um, there are lots of different types of thermometer. There's even when you stick up your bum, which apparently is the most accurate. Who knew? Um, but this one, you only have to stick in your ear, thankfully. Um, and this is the one we keep in the house. Um, 
So I'm sure you've all seen one use it. They used to be like little glass ones that had a, a metal called a liquid metal called mercury in them. And um, we don't use them so much anymore because if they break, the, the actual metal is toxic. Um, so when you um, when you take somebody's temperature, you do this, you take it out, you put it in your ear, you press the button, and it makes a beep, and a little number comes up um, on the little screen there. Now that number is supposed to be 37 to 37.5 degrees Celsius. <clears throat> um, and it's really precise. It, it, our, the reason we have to take our internal temperature, the reason you have to stick it in your ear is because the outside of your body is changing temperature all the time. So if it was really cold here, my fingers were numb. Um, my, my hands could be well below that temperature. Or if I say I had really hot food in my mouth and I was burning my mouth, then that temperature would be much higher, okay? But my internal temperature, the temperature around my organs, my brain, that has to stay at around 37, 37.5 degrees. If it goes up by three degrees or down by three degrees, I might be in trouble. I have to do something about it. Um, and that's true of every human being. So, you know, when your parents were taking your temperature and they were looking at that number on the screen, that's what they were checking. They were checking to see if it was too high or too low. Now, if it's too high, it's called hyperthermia. Um, and you'll start to get really flushed and you'll be sweating because your body's trying to push the blood out to the skin to release heat and the sweating to release heat. If it's really cold, um, if it's three degrees below, you have what's called hypothermia. And that is your body trying to pull the blood in around your organs, protect the organs. So it's saying, forget the rest of the body. We have to look after the heart and the organs and the brain. And so your skin turns pale, your lips turn blue. You start shivering because your muscles are trying to generate heat. Um, and that's only three degrees in the difference. Um, so three or four degrees, and you might have to go to hospital if it's really serious. You certainly have to do something about it. Now, thankfully, we're really good at regulating our temperatures. Our bodies can regulate temperature. Um, you know, I'm sitting here, I've got a roof, I've got walls to protect me from the elements. We have heating in the house. Um, in some countries, you have air conditioning in the buildings because it gets too hot. And we don't have too much of that in Ireland. Um, you're all sitting there. Hopefully, you all have clothes on. Um, again, another way of regulating our temperature. Um, <clears throat> so we tend to think of the environment as, as kind of out there, but actually the environment is everything beyond your skin. You actually, and not just that, but you're breathing it in as well. So your environment is literally the air that you're breathing into your body and it is pressed against your skin. It is the most intimate relationship you're ever going to have. Um, and the temperature is one of those things that is really key. So when we talk about the earth changing temperature by two or three degrees, it doesn't sound like a lot. And when I first heard it, I wasn't, you know, like I said, I was into disasters and I was not impressed. But actually, like our bodies, two or three degrees can make an awfully big difference. So uh, not only does the temperature have to be right, but also I talked about air pressure before. Um, and even though we have hundreds of kilometers of air above us, most of that air is, is, is stuff we can't use. Um, so if you were climbing a really high mountain and you went above, say, 8,000 meters, you're in what mountain climbers call the death zone. And they are not kidding. And that's where the air is too thin to breathe. Now, above that height as well, um, because the air is thin, you don't have much weather. Most of the weather is below that 8,000 meters as well. OK, um, so if you're going up in an airliner, if you're going up in a plane and you're flying really high, that that plane has to be filled with air. It has to be pressurized. Um, so let me just bring this in here. Uh, this is one of the globes we have in the house. As you can see, it's broken. The bottoms come off it, <clears throat> but actually makes it useful. Now I've marked Ireland on this. Um, hopefully you can see that little red circle. Okay. Um, so that's where Ireland is. As you can see, it's very small, right? Um, and again, um, you know, we talk about these big distant things like atmosphere and air, you know, um, climate. So there's Little Ireland. OK, now the International Space Station, it flies at a height of about 350 to 400 kilometers above the Earth. OK, and 350 to 400 kilometers is about the distance from Donegal to Cork. OK, now you can see that that is quite a small distance. That's not even the full length of Ireland. So if I was to show you where the space station is, it's about there, okay? And it's in space, right? There's no air out there. The atmosphere is already gone. So if I was to show you 8,000 meters, 
the breathable amount of our atmosphere, it's that thin layer there. That's as much breathable atmosphere as we have. And it's also where most of our weather is, in that really thin layer. Okay? And when you think about it, that means that every living thing that has ever lived on Earth has lived in that thin skin. Okay? Now, the oceans go down about another 11 kilometers, but really, that's pretty much it. Okay? And when you look at it like that, it's actually a lot more delicate than you might think. Um, so the atmosphere, again, as well as being able to breathe, it's also doing a really important job. It's, it's protecting us from the sun. Um, now, if, when we look up the moon, we can see the moon is just rock. There's nothing growing on the moon. There's no greenery. There's no water. There's no living things. <clears throat> because the moon does not have an atmosphere. Okay. What we don't tend to think of is that um, how much the moon actually changes temperature. So if, if you were looking at the moon in daylight, the sun is shining on the moon, then the rock on the moon gets really hot. It goes over 100 degrees, more than 100 degrees Celsius. And if you're on the dark side of the moon, if you're away from the sun, that, that temperature can drop below zero up to about 200 degrees below zero. Okay. So the moon, the rock on the moon changes temperature by 300 degrees. Um, now, we don't tend to think of it as hot or cold, but that's what the Earth would be without an atmosphere. So if I'm, you can see the light shining on the, on the Earth there, we can imagine that's the sun. So if you can imagine the light is shining on the sun, now, without the atmosphere, what would happen is that side with the sun on it, that would cook, okay? And the side facing away from the sun, that would freeze. It would be freezing cold of space. Without the atmosphere, that's what would happen. With the atmosphere, what happens is the sun shines on the Earth, and the atmosphere holds on to some of that heat. So when it turns away from the sun on the cold side, on the dark side, it doesn't freeze. It holds on to some of that heat and spreads it around. And because the Earth is turning all the time, that warm spot is always moving. And that warm air moving around, that's where we get our weather. Okay. Now, you often hear about greenhouse gases and, and um, in green schools, I'm sure you've done some kind of education on that. So we tend to think of greenhouse gases as a bad thing, but actually they're absolutely vital because the, the part of the atmosphere that's holding on to that heat and making sure it's spread around, they're the greenhouse gases. And they make sure that the earth is never too hot and it's never too cold. It's kind of keeping it just that kind of Goldilocks temperature, okay? <clears throat> and if it, if it wasn't, if those greenhouse gases were the wrong mix, what would happen is you'd have either snowball earth, if there, was, there weren't enough, and that's where literally the earth is covered in ice. Or you could have hothouse earth. And that's where the whole of the earth is too hot. Um, and there have been times when the earth was like that. And they were actually, there were palm trees at the poles. It was that hot. There were crocodiles at the poles. Okay. So the atmosphere is doing a really serious job. And keeping a balance is really important. <clears throat> um, so I need something else here. Here we are. Uh, so this is a log. I'm sure you've all seen logs before. Um, and there's nothing particularly special about this one, uh, although I will say it's mostly made from air. That's that's not quite true. Nearly half of this log was made from air. And again, we tend to think as nature as being, you know, it's out there, it's it's not connected with us. But actually, um, you know, your breath could be part of some tree somewhere. Um, the the plants and the, in the biggest, gnarliest, oldest tree you've ever seen, that didn't grow out of the ground. We tend to think that the trees must get, be getting their food from their roots. Actually, that's not true. Um, a lot of the stuff, a lot of their food comes from the air. They draw in carbon dioxide, they release oxygen, which is really important for us, and they hold on to the carbon um, and they make wood out of the carbon. Um, so a lot of that really hard, solid wood, the hard bit, the carbon, that came from the air. Um, so, and you're breathing out carbon dioxide, so you're breathing out plant food. Um, plants, they really want that. It's really good stuff for them. So your breath could be part of a plant somewhere. It could be part of a tree somewhere. And they're constantly giving us oxygen and we're constantly giving back them the carbon dioxide. And it's a really good balance and it has worked really well for a long time. <laughs> and your bodies are about 20% carbon. You cannot get carbon from anywhere else. You have to get it from plants. You either get it from the plants you eat or you get it from the animals that eat plants when you eat the animals. Um, and <clears throat> as we all know, we get we get the oxygen from the trees. They keep us alive. What's not as well known is that there's also plant life in the oceans called phytoplankton. 
and we get about half of the oxygen from the plant for the planet from the sea, from the phytoplankton in the sea. So we have this constant balance of we breathe out, they take it in, we breathe it out, take it in. And that balance is really spot on. That's exactly where we wanted to be. Um, but then we started burning stuff. Now, um, we do rely on living plants. We really rely on them for our for our air. But we also rely on dead stuff. And we rely on a lot of dead stuff. So all, all of the soil on our planet came from dead stuff. Um, the planet didn't, it wasn't made with, with soil already on it. Um, what happened was early life lived and died over millions of years. And as it died, it didn't rot quite properly, it didn't rot away. And it built up in layer upon layer upon layer. And eventually that's where we got our soil from. So um, I'm sure you all have compost bins. Compost was a really short version of this. It's a really fast version. So anything that was alive can go in your compost bin, whether it's food, paper, or cardboard that doesn't have a lot of ink on it. Anything that was once alive can go in your compost bin. And the compost, basically, um, that all that dead stuff becomes soil. And not just any soil, it becomes really good soil, really nutritious soil. And that's where the earth got its soils from, from all this dead stuff. And then some of that soil would have got waterlogged. And that's where we got peat. And we have a lot of peat in Ireland. Um, so, you know, if you've ever driven along a road and the road is going like that across a country, that's peat because they cannot make a road that stays put on peat. Um, and then over millions of years, more and more of that would have built up. And as the weight crushed down on top, um, the stuff underneath got crushed under huge pressure and it became gold, coal, gas and oil. Um, so all of those things were made from the dead stuff that died on top and then gradually got buried further and further down. Um, and that's why we call them fossil fuels. So this balance of the gases in the atmosphere that keeps our planet nice and warm at just the right temperature, um, we've kind of started messing with that. And carbon dioxide is the one you hear a lot of, um, but there are others. Um, so, now, normally in a session, this is where I might ask somebody, um, what kind of drinks do you like? And, of course, there'll be some people like water or milk. Um, a lot of people that like soft drinks like Coke or Fanta or Dr. Pepper, Prime's a new one. Um, you know, everybody's got their favorite drink. Uh, a lot of the adults might like tea or coffee. Some of you, are, I'm sure, younger ones are drinking tea or coffee. I advise you not to, but sure, what do I know? Um, so I'm going to make a bit of a drink here. Uh, so we have some water. So most of the drinks that you might mention would be water with a little bit of flavor added. And the amount of flavor really matters, doesn't it? I mean, it's, you know, if you're saying you're making my wadi or one of those squashes, um, if you if you don't put enough in, it just looks really thin. If you put too much in, if you or even you try and drink the concentrate, it tastes disgusting. So the amount of flavor in the water really matters. Um, I'm sure you've all been to parties where they give you a kind of, you know, a joga squash and you look at it and you're going, oh, they barely changed the color of that water. There's nothing in there. And you kind of think, this is a party. Let's live it up. Come on, pour some more squash in the water. Um, it's not like we're trying to be healthy. It's a party. But anyway, so the amount of flavor in the water really matters. And as I was saying with the planet, the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, that matters too. The concentration, the amount in the atmosphere. So if you imagine... Uh, Say I was making a cup of coffee. I have a spoon here somewhere. So I'm just going to add a little bit of coffee. Now, that's probably too weak, okay? And if this was our atmosphere, there wouldn't be enough greenhouse gases in that. It's too thin. It would be too cold. Uh, obviously, our atmosphere is not brown, although... There would have been a time back before you were born when we had smog and smog was literally where there were, the air was full of smoke, so full of smoke, it changed the color of the air. And I remember being in Dublin once on an evening, a winter evening and looking up and seeing a brown sky and that was smog. So we literally had put so much smoke into the air, we had changed the color of the sky. Um, but anyway, so let's say we're making we're making coffee. And this is now for me, I like my coffee fairly strong. This is too weak. OK, so. I'm just going to add in a little bit more. See another spoonful or so. Okay. And that's about right. 
Okay. Now it's still mostly water. There's only a little bit of coffee in there, but the mix is right. And that was where our atmosphere was for a very long time. And then we had a thing called the Industrial Revolution, where we started using steam engines for everything. Um, and the steam engines ran on uh, oil, mostly coal, though. And the more coal we burnt, the more smoke went up into the air. And we started to change our air. And even though we were humans, and there's a lot of atmosphere, because there's hundreds of kilometers of it above us, gradually, we added a bit more, and 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 we kept adding. For over 200 years, we kept adding it, and we're still adding it. So now we have changed the composition of our atmosphere. And even though it's still mostly water, there's a lot of coffee in there. Uh, before anybody asks, no, I am not going to drink it. Somebody always asks. Okay. And that's what happened. We added these, we added these uh, gases to our atmosphere and changed our atmosphere. And now carbon dioxide is the one we talk about a lot. There's another one called methane. Ireland is really good at producing methane because Ireland is really good at raising cattle. <laughs> we are, are famous for the quality of our beef, uh, for the milk, for our cheese. We're really well known for it. Our, our farmers are really good at it. Unfortunately, cows make a gas called methane. Um, cows do something that the humans cannot do. They can digest grass. And it doesn't make for a very interesting life because you have to eat all the time and you have to be chewing all the time but there's lots of it. Um, so they make they eat the grass, they digest the grass. And then at this point, again, if somebody was here, I'd be saying like, which end of the cow do you think it comes out of? Most people think it's the farts. Actually, it's the burps, okay? So it's not the farts, it's the burps. It's the, the front end, not the back end of the cow it comes out of. And they breathe out methane, basically. They're, ex they're hailing methane, burping it out. And methane, if you imagine carbon dioxide is like a normal human being, Methane would be like the incredible Hulk of greenhouse gases. It's a hundred times worse. Okay. It's really powerful. Um, and we, like I said, in Ireland, we are really good at making methane. Um, and we have to go back to remember that even though it's a big world, our bit of it is really thin. Okay. The bit that we can live in, the bit we can survive in. And even though it is this fast planet, we have actually managed to change. Um, we've managed to change our, our, uh, our the composition of our atmosphere. Um, so the problem with that, with with kind of this, is, is it is a long, slow problem. And we have brains made for stories, which is why I created Feel the Change. Okay, because um, first of all, I like people to be able to tell stories, and it teaches you how to do that. But it also we have to be able to tell the difference between what works in stories and what works in real life. <laughs> so in stories, we tend to like big dramatic solutions. You know, we like people running and falling down and jumping off stuff and helicopters flying in and dogs getting rescued. Um, that's the kind of stuff that looks good in story. So if this was a Hollywood blockbuster, what would probably happen is the Americans would just drop a, riot, a bomb in the right place. You know, maybe they'd put it like a nuclear bomb in the Earth's core or something, and that would sort everything. We just need the right kind of explosion. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't really work in the real world. <clears throat> so a lot of our ordinary stuff, um, that that's actually dealt with in kind of long, slow, and often quite boring ways, you know? Um, so... And also in stories, we tend to look for drama. It's really important that you kind of up the drama in stories that things are exciting and immediate and sudden um, and loud. You know, these are the things we look for in stories. So, um, but in the real world, we try and avoid drama. So a lot of the ordinary boring stuff that you do every day is actually intended to avoid the drama. And I know sometimes you feel like your parents are kind of on your case all the time. And maybe you even think your parents are a bit boring. Um, well, the reason they're boring is because they had you. You know, all of a sudden they had to set a good example. They were responsible for another life, you know, and they had to take care of you. And that often involves doing kind of slow, boring things to avoid the drama. So, um, you know, you might brush your teeth every day so that the dentist doesn't have a much more dramatic scene where he pulls all your teeth out because they're rotten. 
or you look both ways crossing the road. So you avoid the dramatic scene of being hit by a car. Um, and if you think back to the pandemic, um, you know, when we all wore masks, it was it was inconvenient. It was a pain in the neck, you know, um, you know, standing waiting outside a shop because there were too many people in the shop. So all these little things we had to do during the pandemic and they didn't feel heroic. They didn't feel like you were doing anything productive. It didn't feel like you were having any, you know, having any effect. But actually, that did work. It didn't feel like it was working because it was slow and it was boring, but it saved lives. It really saved lives because we slowed the spread of a really, uh, a really dangerous disease. And a lot of the stuff we do is like that. It's slow and it's boring, but it's actually really effective. So the kinds of things that we need to do about climate change and the things that are going to call that are being caused by climate change are generally going to be quite slow and boring, but work. Um, so you don't have to jump out of a helicopter. You don't have to go fight a shark. Um, you know, a lot of, I and mean, also uh, one person on their own generally is not going to have any effect. You're not going to be any use on your own. There's no, you're not going to have any effect, but you're not on your own. You are one of many. Um, if I asked one of you, like say I had my car broken down and I asked one of you to go out and push my car, you probably wouldn't get very far. But if I asked a whole class of you to go out and push my car, I'd probably have to chase you down the road, right? You'd be moving the car so fast. So it's the stuff that we do together. Um, and it's normal, like often if I was doing a talk like this, I would talk about, I might talk about like, you know, switching off the lights or using water better, all the stuff that Green Schools covers really well. But I think the most important thing to remember is that um, it's when we do things together in large groups that we have a really big effect. Um, you know, one person on their own is not going to be doing something is really not going to have a big effect. But if you are one of million, a million people doing the same thing, that does have a big effect. That has a major effect. And we often feel quite powerless when we when we think about climate change. But actually, when you think about it, we changed our weather and we did it by accident. Um, that's the kind of power we have. So imagine the kind of power we could wield if we decided to do something deliberately about it. Um, and there are already millions of people involved. This is this is the biggest movement the world has ever seen. So, um, and like I said, with with ordinary solutions, a lot of it is slow and boring, but it has a really big effect. And there's a contrast between that and what we like in stories. Um, and in stories, drama's great. We go all out. In the real world, we try and avoid it. Um, but actually, we are now part of something huge. We are part of something that as, you know, in, it's on a world scale. It is really dramatic. But because we don't feel, we don't often don't feel part of it because it's so big, because it's so distant, um, it's hard to kind of be passionate about it. It's hard to kind of have a kind of any serious interest in it. Um, and I think that's one of the things that stories can do. That was why I wrote this and why I want people to write stories about this stuff is because it gets you thinking about all the different things in the same way that, you know, that you're immersed in air, that you have an effect on the environment because you buy stuff and use stuff all the time. When you start about thinking about all the different things that this affects in our lives, um, it can have a really big effect. And that's something the resource does. Now, for the teachers, um, there's an intro video that kind of covers how to use the resource and how to relate it kind of back to, you know, we're trying to relate stories to, or to, to the students' lives. Um, and the intro video talks about how to do that. Um, but the main thing is that we can look at all these things that are happening because of climate change and we can think, right, how do we make stories out of them? How do I get more involved? And I kind of feel like this is more relevant to me. Um, and that's what Fields of Change, that's what the resource is all about. Um, so I'm, I'm going to stop there. I think we have some questions. Monica, do you want to read some of those out? And we'll I'll try and answer them as best I can. Perfect. Thanks so much, Oshin. That was uh, really interesting to hear as well. And we have a couple of questions that have rolled in. So um, what's your favorite story in Feel the Change? The first one. Oh, that's a tricky one. Um, I often get asked, what, what's my favorite book what, of the books I've written? Um, the I don't know, because they do different re they do different jobs. I think what I wanted to have was a range of stories in it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, there is one at the end that's quite simple and it's to do with, and it's based on a real event. It's where trees started sliding down a slope and they were still standing up 
and it's an image that really stuck in my head. Um, and there's another one, um, one I want, I wrote quite early on where um, a kid is stuck up in a house and it was, it was like something I did when I was a kid, me and my friends would go looking for dens during the summer places we could kind of do up and, and kind of have as kind of our hideouts. Um, and the, the first story in Veal the Change is about that, about um, a boy who's being bullied um, and he, he hides out in this building and then realizes the building is starting to collapse because the river has eaten in under the building. Um, so in each of them, I'm, I'm trying to look at a different aspect of this and trying to find the drama in it. Um, because like I said, that's the thing with the stories is the stories have stories have dramatic solutions. They have immediate solutions. Um, and they're kind of, they're easy. It's easier to get your attention than, you know, those big slow ones. Great. Thanks so much, Oshin. And what age, this is from Colin Corkery. What age did you find yourself getting better at stories? And the actual question is from Paige in County Local School. Um, Oh, I hopefully I'm still getting better. <laughs> um, it is one of those things you kind of you 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 kind of keep improving all the way through your life. So I don't think there was a point where, um, like I said, that the story I told at the beginning. I mean, that would have been really typical of what I was writing when I was six or seven. Um, I started getting more serious about it when I was about in fifth class, and um, and I would kind of you know I'd I'd sit in at lunch times and kind of write my stories and. Um, and I was really starting to think about how stories were made around that age when I started taking that more seriously. So I probably around, I'm probably around the, the age of this group here, 10 plus, where between, between kind of say 10 years old and my early teens, I think that was where kind of things went boom. And I started really thinking about how to make stories um, and what it was that got them, got me involved in stories, you know. Um, but you keep on going and it's... Um, it really does make a difference, you know, particularly for teachers, you know, to encourage this and and see the value of it. Um, but I don't think there's been any point where I could say I've, I've mastered this. I know, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm a professional now. I do this for a living, um, but I still never feel like I'm completely on top of it. I still have, you know, and you'll hear this from writers all the time. You still have doubts about how good you are or, you know, you, you struggle with stuff. But also it's a challenge that you enjoy. You enjoy overcoming this stuff. Um, so that's a big part of it is, is liking the challenge of it being difficult. Um, that's part of what kind of keeps you going at it. Perfect. Thank you so much. And we have a, another one from actually anonymous. Uh, will you read us a story as well? And then I don't know if this is the same uh, person. What's your favorite book on climate change for teenagers and young adults? um okay i i can't i don't think we have time to read a story now i will say that actually this, this is a good opportunity all of the all of the text all of the stories that are in feel the change are we have audio files for them so i don't know if you can put the, the link up there but actually if you get the document for for feel the change all the links are in there so i've read all of them onto um audio files um and they're available on video so you can kind of you can download them and, and just listen to them if you want um but uh sorry what was the other what's the best book for teenagers um i don't know i actually don't many i don't know i haven't read many books for teenagers on climate change i've written one which is called the short hopeful guide to climate change um that's actually uh, the, the, there is a, a, um, a reference to that in the back pages of the the resource um and that was i really wanted to find the interesting stuff because it one of the things about the subject it is it does make you look at the world in a different way you know, the world it really is, it's, it's giving us a kick up the arse and telling us to cop ourselves on. Um, and it makes you look at different things around the world in different ways. So I wrote a book called The Short Hopeful Guide to Climate Change to try and capture that um, and capture the fascination I have with it all. Um, but I'm not sure, actually, I can't remember, I can't think of any offhand that I've read. Um, there is a growing number of these things and people are getting really good at writing and tackling these subjects. Um but also, I think books are very personal. So something that would work for me might not necessarily work for somebody else. Um, also, I'm old. So, you know, uh, my tastes aren't always to be trusted. Uh, we have a couple of more as well. Uh, what's your favorite story from your childhood? <laughs> oh, as in, now that could be for, as in a book I've read or something that happened to me. Um, <clears throat> we'll, we'll say book, a book that I've read. Um, 
So I, I went through phases, you know, the way everybody does, you, you read different books at different levels and different ages, and they all have a different effect on you. So when I was looking at the kind of the people who we have here today, you know, again, 10 plus fifth, sixth class upwards, um, I liked, uh, I did like a bit of horror. I was starting to get into horror, but I, I loved um, Roald Dahl's stories. I loved Tolkien's Lord of the Rings and C.S. Lewis Narnia. But I was also big into comics. I read a lot of comics and they would have been a lot of them would be kind of Second World War comics. There was also a comic called 2000 AD that I kind of got into a bit later, um, kind of science fiction and fantasy and, and horror comic. Um, and uh, it was funny because when I was that age, you went from children's books straight into adult books because there wasn't there was nothing much for teenagers specifically. Um, so I went from reading um uh, you know, the likes of Lord of the Rings or uh, Narnia stories or Hardy Boys into reading Cold War thrillers and Westerns and that kind of stuff. Um, but I don't think there, there wasn't one writer in particular who was my favorite all the way through because you change and you grow and your tastes change, you know. Most definitely. It's great that there's more content out there for young adults as well, as you said. And we have a question from Sinead McCann. What age were you when you wrote? slash published your first book um i was i was i wrote it in my mid-20s um and i i swore i'd get published before i was 30 uh, i'm sure you all think that's really old already um so i had worked in i'd worked as a commercial artist so i was an illustrator and i drew or painted for money that's what a commercial artist does um and so i had illustrated a lot of books before i got published as a writer um so I literally just got my first publishing contracts before I turned 30. So I just made it. Um, and actually, the funny enough, I didn't, my, the first book I wrote, which was called The Harvestside Project, is this kind of, I went all out for to write a fantasy thriller. Um, that actually wasn't the first book published. I was looking for illustration work from a publisher called O'Brien Press. And they liked one of the styles I worked in, but they didn't, um, they didn't have any books for me to work on. They had a series they wanted to recover young kids. Uh, and But they didn't, have any, they didn't have anything for me to illustrate just yet. And I said, well, I write, so so give me a crack at it. Um, and that was how the first two Mad Grandad books happened. Um, so they actually, and I'd already written my second novel at that point. So they actually published four books in a row. They published the first two Mad Grandad books and then uh, another one called The Gods and the Machines. And then the first book I actually wrote, The Harvestite Project, that was published fourth. Um, so I was just I just turned 30 when I got the contracts for those and it was 2003. Um, so it was kind of a weird way to do it. Um, and it kind of they ended up getting published the wrong way around. But, you know, I was happy enough. Four books, four books in a row is good. Great. You got there in the finish. Doesn't matter what uh, sequence it was. And yeah. this is from Miss Watson. Uh, when and where did you start to have an interest in climate action? from Rahara National School, if I pronounced that right? Um, well, I mean, I was, there was a time, probably actually around fifth and sixth class, where I didn't, I didn't know anybody who was a writer, and I didn't know anybody who was an illustrator, and I, I, did, I thought you had to have a proper job. And so for a while, even though I was still writing stories, I wanted to be a zoologist. Um, a zoologist is somebody who studies animals. So if you've ever been to the um, there's a place called Zoological Gardens, which we never we never actually call it that. That's the zoo. That's where a zoo comes from, is Zoological Gardens. So I was always interested in animals. And um, so for the first few years of secondary school, I thought I had a proper job. And I thought I had a proper job. And I would, I figured, well, I'll try and be a scientist. What kind of science am I into? I'm into animals. So I will, I will study zoology. Um, so I think it probably, probably the interesting environment started there. Um, and it kind of crossed over into storytelling because every story has a kind of ecology to it. Like the, the characters, this is something I, I meant, it does mention and it is kind of covered in Feel the Change. Your characters are very much shaped by the place they grow up in, just as we all are. Um, and <clears throat> for me, I kind of was always most interested in the weird animals or the dangerous ones. And so you're also looking at what kind of world are they living in? You know, there's a difference between the world a shark or a moray eel lives in as opposed to a lion or a tiger um, or a polar bear. Um, so for me, those kind of all started to blend together. The, the, the interest in, in ecology and the interest in storytelling. Um, 
And so I think, but I, I think we started hearing about global warming um, back in probably the really late 80s, or early 90s, I think. Um, but it was again, like I said, it was really hard to get your head around it. It didn't feel like a big deal. And it also felt like something that was very far in the future. Now, for you, it, it, it like for me, it's now obviously I'm 50, so um, it's quite far in my future. Um, but uh, it, it definitely kind of started to make itself felt. But we also had other things going on. There was kind of more immediate environmental stuff in Ireland as well as everywhere else. <clears throat> so when I talk about the smog and the air being, you know, the sky being brown, we had a really visual um, uh, thing to think about when we heard about things like pollution. And uh, and we do have very visual things like, you know, you talk about the, the islands of plastic out on the sea. So to some extent, we we did have, there were things that we could see that were having an effect. And also Ireland, the litter in Ireland is really bad. You have plastic bags hanging on trees. So we had a kind of a more tangible way to think about the environment back then. Um, but as we started to clear those things up, this other big problem was starting to happen. And so it kind of went from generally like an interest in the environment to this bigger picture of this is the whole world it's affecting um, and it's a whole world problem. So that probably, so initially I'd say, yeah, early nineties. Um, and then I, I got into, I got into this project. Um, so and some of the work from Field of Change is in this project where we did a thing called weather stations. And that was five different writers from five different countries. And we all had to go and learn about climate change and explore how you could do, you know, kind of do storytelling that involved climate change. So I had to go to play, actually, ironically, I had to burn jet fuel. I had to fly to other countries to learn about climate change. Um, and I think that's where my kind of, that's where it became more serious. That's when I started really paying attention to it. Yeah, it's ironic how to learn more often you have to weigh up the choices about maybe international travel as well. But um, thank you so much. And we've a couple of more questions rolling in as well. Uh, yep. What is your favourite thing to do about climate change from Sinead? <clears throat> That's actually a really relevant question. Um, the thing is, we often hear about the same things all the time. We hear about recycling. We hear about how we use water or electricity. Um, but actually, going back to the whole idea that we are sitting, like the, the environment is pressed against my skin. You know, we're breathing it in. Everything we do has an effect. I mean, you can see my studio behind me and everything here came from the earth. You know, I'm looking into a computer screen, which seems like an artificial thing, but it was made from things from the earth. So literally everything we do has an effect. And the effect that I would have would be different to what other people would have. You know, there's nobody here. I mean, apart from the teachers, obviously, but the, the children here, they're not voting. They're not driving cars. Um, you know, they're not doing the shopping. So there's a lot of stuff they don't have control over. Um but we each have an we each have an effect on our environment. And um, if if you did nothing else but just sit there all day, you're still breathing out. You're still changing the chemical composition of the air. So I would say, find something that you're already interested in, and think about the effect that has on the environment. Because there are loads of different things we can do, um, and you can't do everything. It's it's really like I think sometimes it can feel overwhelming that you kind of have to. Oh, I have to do this, and I have to do this, and I have to do this, and I have to do this. And I, I think. Pick one thing, pick the thing you're into. Um, so I write I write for children. Um, so I write about this stuff. Um, and I give talks in school sometimes. And um, and I try to, try to do little bits, you know, try and live a less wasteful life. Um, but I'm certainly not perfect. And I, I kind of, you know, I'm still, I still have bad habits. I'm still doing things that are damaging the environment. It's very hard not to if you kind of want to live a life. But um, I would say find the thing that matters to you or find things that interest you because, we all have different passions. We all have different things we want to do. And that, again, is part of the, that's part of the point of the resource is to make it relevant to whoever's doing it, as opposed to just saying there's one thing that everybody has to do. And that's the thing, the only thing you can do. Excellent. Thanks so much, much Oshin, as well. And if you've time, we have a couple of more questions. Uh, yeah, what okay. do you think the outcome will be in regards to climate change? Oh, that's a big question. Um, I do have hope. Uh, I think we are going to be living in a changed world. Uh, I don't think there's any question that we have kind of, we have missed the point where we could have fixed it completely. Um, but at the same time, I think we are capable of incredible things. Um, 
So uh, in, in my other book, The Short Hope Will Guide to Climate Change, the last part of the book is devoted to the things that we have done in the past. And I think that's really important that to mention our achievements and to say that we are capable of incredible stuff. You know, in 50 years, we went from being just barely being able to fly across the Atlantic to landing people on the moon. Um, you know, there was a there was a really dangerous disease called smallpox and we wiped it out. We just decided that that's enough. It's done. It's gone. And we wiped out smallpox. Um, we um, there was a thing that was endangering the ozone in the atmosphere, um, uh, chlorofluorocarbons, the chemical that was being produced for aerosols. And the world as a whole decided, nope, it's too risky. We're stopping. Um, and it did something about it and it stopped it. So I believe that we are capable of really incredible things. Um, and, and the thing is, we are we have been doing something about this all along. People have been working on this for decades. Millions of people are involved, as I said. Um, so, But it's slow, and it can be hard to see because it's slow, and a lot of it seems ordinary. But the world that we live in now is very world from the, very different from the world I lived in in the 80s. You know, a huge amount has already changed, but it can be hard to see because that change is slow. Um, so I do, I do think, I think, as I said before, I think this is the earth giving us kick up the arse and telling us to cop ourselves on. And we are doing it slowly. We could be doing it faster. We definitely have to. Um, but it is definitely, we are, you know, we are changing. And we don't have a choice. I mean, we're burning oil and coal and gas and those things took millions of years to make. We can't make them again. We're going to run out of them. So we just have to stop. There's just no question about it. We just have to stop and find other ways to make our energy. Uh, very well said. And I think this is the last question we have. Uh, how many books have you written from Sinead? Uh, well, well, I've published 45. And then I think about a dozen short stories. Um, and uh, although uh, this kind of um, the last few projects have kind of been around climate change, but most of them are like all sorts of stuff, uh, anything from stuff for young readers up to novels. Um, and then there's there's always a few kind of on the back burner, either they're still waiting to get published or I haven't found publishers for them or um, I haven't feel like I've quite finished them. But it's 45 books that have actually been published. And then there's this, Feel the Change. Great. Uh, where where would be the best place to follow your work, Oshin, or to find you as well? Um, just Oshin. just the website is oshinmcgann.com and um, you kind of find all the work there. Um, and then, of course, uh, I think you posted the links for for the resource, um, and then all the all the links for the audio, the video files are in the resource as well. So hopefully, people will, will make good use of them. Brilliant. Uh, well, I don't think there's any further questions. We had ten roll in, which is great. Just That's a couple good. of comments. So thanks, Oshin, uh, to everyone, and uh, well, thank you for the kind of comments. And uh, yeah, I hope, I hope everybody found this interesting. Um, thanks very much for, for everybody joining in. We're really grateful. Brilliant Enjoy the rest of your Climate Action Week. Loads of great comments rolling in there as well. Everyone saying thanks. And so thanks, everyone. We'll wrap up there if there are no further questions. And I posted my email there if anyone wants to contact me as well. But thanks so much, Oshin. It was really interesting to hear about your background, how you got involved with storytelling and story writing, and then obviously the big influence that climate change has had on it as well. So, and Grania has posted our newsletter there as well, if any, and if anyone else wants to see. So thanks everyone. I hope you enjoy Climate Action Week and let us know how you get on on our social media as well. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks, Oshin. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.